So there's this phrase that you often hear in like um, action movies or thrillers or whatever, and the phrase goes like this, uh, everyone has a price. Everyone has a price. And it basically implies this, that no matter how moral or ethical you might think or you might think someone is, uh, they will throw those ethics and those principles under the bus if the price is right. Money talks, or so they say. And so to illustrate this point in just a small little way, I want to play a little game this morning. How many of you would drink mustard for free? <laughs> Nobody? How about for $10? For $100? For a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. You wouldn't do it for ten thousand dollars. Uh, you drink, uh, let's say, a half a cup. Ten thousand dollars, really? I mean, that's a lot of money for like drinking half a cup of mustard. Okay, how about a hundred thousand? How about a million? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm sad to say that many of you are more principled than me when it comes to drinking mustard because my price was being on the radio. Now, you might say, look, I was a teenager, okay? And teenagers make stupid decisions. And when I was a teenager, I, I once drank about half a cup of mustard on the radio. Now you might be thinking and saying to yourself, Alan, nobody saw you. Why would you drink it on the radio? You know, if you're going to do something like that, you might as well be seen of men to be praised of them, right? You did it on the radio. That's ridiculous. But like I said, you're more principled than me. Sometimes we're willing to compromise our ethics, our principles, if the price is right. And there's, there's other things, however, that are priceless. And we won't compromise no matter the price. Not everything or any, everyone has a price. And this, despite what Holly Weird might suggest. Now, every time I gotta flip my page, I gotta do this. That's a bit annoying. The salvation of your soul has a price on it, but it's not with dollars. The payment can't be made with money. The payment was made with the blood of Jesus. It took God stepping off his throne and becoming a human being and living a perfect life and dying for your sins to save you. That was the price for your soul. There is no price high enough to attain God's gift of salvation. No price that is in money. You can't buy the Holy Spirit. Jesus paid the price for you. He shed his blood. His blood was the currency with which your salvation had to be bought. And no amount of Federal Reserve paper or Bank of Canada polymer, which is all garbage anyways, could pay that price for your soul. The Holy Spirit of God can't be purchased with money. We need to repent of this false idea and be cleansed from our sin. Now, harsh, perse harsh persecution, well, I can't even speak today, uh, rose against the church in Jerusalem after Stephen was martyred. We learned about the martyrdom of Stephen a bit ago. And, and so the believers, what happened is they scattered and they fled to other cities where they would be safe. Uh, but as they were scattered, see, they didn't quit preaching. They kept preaching, they kept reaching out, they kept uh, telling people about the Lord Jesus. So the, uh, the argument often arises about whether Christians should stay in the place where there's persecution or whether Christians should flee to somewhere that is maybe a bit more safe. And each situation is unique, of course, but in this instance, we see many believers fleeing, not staying. God had allowed this persecution to come to them, um, and what the, what the devil meant for evil, actually, God meant for good, because now the gospel is being spread all over the, all over the land, not just in Jerusalem. Uh, God gave them a reason to spread, 
And as they spread, the gospel went with them. And Philip was one of the seven uh, that was chosen to serve in Jerusalem uh, to ensure that the widows would get their fair share of the daily distribution. And he was one of the ones who was also dispersed with the many believers. And he found himself in a place called Samaria. Philip was a well-loved man by the people, the saints in Jerusalem. He was a kind, gentle, compassionate, lovable guy, hence why he was you know, called to, to serve in that ministry. But he was a Jew, and as it goes, historically, Jews and Samaritans didn't really get along. The feud between the Jews and the Samaritans goes all the way back to 722 BC when the northern kingdom of Israel, which is up here, and the southern kingdom of Judah, which is down here, the northern was taken away by the Assyrian army, and many of the Jews were taken captive to Assyria, and many of the pagans moved into the northern kingdom. And what happened there was the remaining Jews intermarried with the pagans, and repopulated the area. So the native Jews looked upon the Samaritans as sort of half-breeds, you know, mutts, unclean animals. Uh, they weren't true children of Abraham because they mingled with the Assyrians. The, you know, those filthy, ungodly pagans who ransacked Israel, who took many of their daughters to be with their men, which is an abomination for the Israelites. The Bible tells us there's nothing new under the sun, and as always, the Bible is right. Uh, the ethnic division we see in our world right now is not new. You know, racism, as the pagans like to call it, is not new. It's just taken on a new word. In biblical times, the term race, the term race and the idea of race did not exist. There were only nationalities, tribes, and languages. This is how people were divided in ancient days. It wasn't based on race, it was based on tribal affiliation and language. A person with dark skin from Ethiopia and a person with dark skin from Egypt weren't considered the same race. They were identified with their tribal affiliation. But division ex is existed nonetheless, obviously, and the division that existed in their day and the division that exists in our day is both are both based on the same sinful attitude. The uh, racial division we're seeing is the fruit from the root of the same satanic lie that divided Jews and Samaritans in Philip's day. And that lie is this, you are different from me in some way, therefore you are not as clean or as pure as me. So therefore, I hate you. And just like the division in our day, the division in Philip's day had a long history behind it. The Jews and Samaritans were, were beefing for a long, long time, and it was a division that was shrouded with injustice and sin. So we see the socio-political um, arena Philip was stepping into was not so much different than the one we're stepping into. And I would argue that his situation was a bit more fiery than our situation. So Philip, a native Jew from Jerusalem, finds himself in Samaria, the territory of the traitors and the interminglers, the Jewish half-breeds, if you will. But Philip did not discriminate. He decided instead to preach the gospel to them, despite the ethnic and religious and political tensions that existed between Jews and Samaritans. Philip came proclaiming the message, Jesus is the Christ of Israel, and that they too, Samaritans, can have a lot in the kingdom of God. And so the people were all attentive. They were amazed at, the, at his message, at the signs that accompanied the miracles he performed. I mean, here you have a native Jew preaching to the Samaritans that the, the Israeli, the Israelite Messiah, Jesus, is their Messiah too. That is unheard of. You wouldn't have never heard a Jew go into Samaria and say the Messiah of Israel has come to save you. You would have never heard that. You would have heard the opposite. Oh, you're a Samaritan? Well, the Messiah is coming to, to, to crush you because you're a half-breed, because you're a mutt, because you're, you're a traitor. But here's Philip saying, no, the Messiah of Israel has come to save you. 
what, what, that's different. Oh, and then there's miracles. Well, what's going on here? So everyone was amazed. The deep-rooted historical hatred was being healed in the name of Jesus because the power of the gospel does what no man or government or religion can do. You know this, like, racism isn't getting better? It's been, like, what, a hundred years or so of trying to mend this thing, and it just seems to, like, have ebbs and flows. It gets a little better, it gets worse, gets better, gets worse. But it never, it's never done with. Because governments of men can't fix it. Only Jesus can fix it. And when we finally figure that out, it'll be gone. It's so important for us to take to heart that the gospel is the only hope for any lasting reconciliation. Christ can undo hundreds of years of hatred and bloodshed between people groups like that in an instant. He can do it. He has done it in many places. The preaching of the gospel amazed the people, but they were also taken aback by the signs and miracles that God worked through Philip because it added some sort of uh, weight behind the message be one thing to come and say a few things, but when their miracles and stuff start happening, well, wait a minute, maybe this is legit, that people were thinking. So Acts 8, 7 to 8 says, uh, For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. The miracles, the signs, not only brought joy to the city, but it also caught the eye of a prominent magician of Samaria. Acts 8, 9 tells us about this guy. It says, But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. Well, I could say I'm some. Who cares if he himself says it, right? Verse 10. Then uh, they all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. Wow. Simon uh, was a magician. He was highly feared and esteemed by the people. Simon was called the power of God that is called great. Now you might go, wow, that's a pretty lofty title to give to a guy. But if you do a little research, you'll discover that that title was actually given to the Roman high god Zeus. And so people thought this Simon guy was like the incarnation of Zeus. This is the power of God called great. This is Zeus. He's come to us. Look at this guy. So we can see here alone, right, that the people of Samaria, Samaria were actually quite idolatrous. They're worshiping a guy as Zeus and saying that they're Jews. Doesn't work that way. First commandment. Come on. You missed that part? These are quite idolatrous people. No Jew would ever call a man the power of God that is called great, some magician. They wouldn't call a, a human being after the name of a false pagan god. But he amazed the people with his dark arts, and he claimed to have power over nature and power over the demonic, and, and he fooled everyone. Some believe he even fooled himself. But when Philip arrived on the scene preaching Christ and that Jesus was the Messiah, and when he performed actual miracles, even Simon was like, whoa, this guy's doing something real. He's, he's acquainted with the fake, right? He knows how to do the tricks. He knows how to do the illusions. He knows how to fake it. So when he sees something real, he goes, whoa, wait a minute, what's this? So he was impressed, and he believed the gospel, it says, and he was baptized. Simon had never seen miracles like those that Philip uh, uh, was uh, having accompanying his preaching. You know, there's chronic diseases healed, crippled people were walking, blind people were receiving their sight. Simon had never done anything like that. He's never seen anything like that. So the man who was dubbed by the people, the power of God that is called great, was brought low and humbled by the real power of God that is actually great. So, I ask you, is there today, in our day, in 2021, charlatans? Are there Simons in our midst? Preachers who perform fake miracles? Does that exist? Look, I once went to a revival meeting 
where the preacher was calling out various symptoms. People would identify with those symptoms and they would go for prayer. And believe it or not, they really believed this guy had like supernatural revelation into their ailments. Now look, anyone can just stand up and say stuff. Okay? What? Well, I'll do it right now. I'll prove it. Ready? Okay, here we go. I'm seeing a head. Who has a head here this morning? Um... The, the head, it, it has something, a pain or a scab or something with the head. A anybody here have a head that has some sort of an ailment in the head area? I'm seeing also a girl. Anybody have sisters or, or does anybody here have a mother um, or a grandmother who, who maybe there's something with their head? Anybody? Okay, I'm seeing over here in this area that there's somebody who knows a girl or is a girl with a head that has some sort of a, an ailment. If that's you, the Lord is speaking to you this morning and he's saying he's going to heal your head this morning. Or maybe it's your mother or maybe it's your great, or maybe anybody here pregnant with a girl who has a head? It's not hard. <laughs> Anyone could do this. A leg. Anybody have a leg? I'm seeing fingers, um, something in the body, something in the human body is, is wrong with somebody. It's not hard. Uh, like, you might laugh, but this is what happens. And I was in a meeting where this happened. And the guy, the guy goes up and he, he starts talking about somebody, no, somebody with polio. Polio? Anybody have polio? I'm like, polio? When's the last time anyone had polio in Canada? Was there like two cases a year or something? Nobody had polio that morning or afternoon or whatever it was, by the way. But he saw it, maybe in a loved one distantly in the, in the past who might have had polio or something. You see how easy it is? It's not supernatural at all. You can practice this sort of thing and get better, right? See someone walk in with crutches? Somebody's having a problem walking here this morning. You know, oh, the guy with the crutches, maybe. <laughs> Some people fall for it. They do. I've told this story before here, but I'll tell it again because it's quite funny. But there's a woman in one revival. I've got, why have I gotten to so many of these meetings? I don't know. Maybe I just find them amusing. But there was one woman who asked for weight loss, supernatural weight loss. And the, the pastor was like, you know, praying for her. And he told her, and you, some of you have heard this, but I'll say it again. He told her, when I'm praying, be sure to hold on to your pants. Because you're going to lose weight supernaturally and you don't want your pants to fall. Okay, so I'm not joking. This is real. So he prays for her and she's going like this, you know, thank you, Lord, whatever. And he finishes praying, and she goes, yeah, I feel lighter. You know what we did right after the meeting? Ate pizza. We ate pizza. Look, I'm not going to go there. The Simons of the world, they amaze some people, but when the power of God actually shows up, even they can't resist it. When the real power of God comes, people rush to it, they receive it, because it's real. And the tragedy is that there's so much fake that for the average person, what they're seeing is just a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, a bunch of uh, hocus-pocus, that they just reject the Lord completely. They say, no, I don't want any part of that supernatural weight loss stuff. You know, I'll just cut my calories and walk for 30 minutes a day. And I'll tell you what, that'll do more for you than going to Hocus Pocus Man to pray for supernatural weight loss. Your pants won't fall, especially if you eat pizza after. Believe me. So what now? Well, the apostles come down from Jerusalem because they hear about this. People getting saved in Samaria and stuff like that. And so they come down to pray for the Samaritans. Verse number 14 tells us, Now when the apostles, 
at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Theologians like to call this event the Samaritan Pentecost. So the, uh, the apostles come from Jerusalem to pray for the new believers, and they lay their hands on them, and they pray, and they all receive the Holy Spirit right there on the spot, and they're baptized in the Spirit, just like the apostles were uh, on the day of Pentecost. And it all happened when the apostles laid their hands on them and prayed for them. So this caught the attention of Simon, right? Simon's sort of looking at this, and these other guys come from out of town, and they lay their hands on people, and then they receive the Holy Spirit. So they start speaking other languages, and there's, you know, just a, a, a visible manifestation of God's Spirit. And he's like, whoa, what's going on here? He saw that the apostles seemed to have some sort of power to, to give the Holy Spirit away to whoever uh, they wanted to. So Simon, being a Simon, he said, well, I want a piece of that pie, right? I can, maybe he thought I can make some money with this or something, right? Because this is some, some serious power. So his old way of deception and greed, it got the best of him. It says here in verse 18, Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. He offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So Simon, he was used to tricking people with false signs, taking their money in the process. But now he saw people being miraculously healed and the Spirit given to people and, and wonders and signs uh, that were genuine and indisputable. And perhaps he thought this was a lucrative financial opportunity in that if he too could do this, have the real power of God, well, it would just boost his business a bit more. So, so um, he, he goes and he says, hey, I got some money. Can you give me this power also? He could actually be called the power of God that is that is called great, if he could do this. So he approaches the apostles with money. Now, it's interesting that he offers them silver, not even gold. Like, come on. You, you, you want the apostles to give you this power, you're going to give them just silver? Like, yeah, silver has some monetary value, but gold has better monetary value. So he's kind of trying to even undercut them a bit. Here's some silver. Can, silver? You don't even give the Lord gold? You don't even give your best? So here we hear what he says. Give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Give me this power also. Like the, the question becomes, you know, was Simon a true believer? People ask. Perhaps some say yes, some say no. I tend to think he probably was. He was just immature in the faith. And his greed got the best of him in this moment. He needed discipleship and a strong rebuke to get him on the right way. And that's exactly what Peter gives him. Simon wanted the fame. He wanted the power of the apostles, what they possess. Now, are there also Simons like this in the church today? Are there those who think they can buy the power of God? Leaders who say things like, you know, give me maybe a thousand dollars seed offering and God will pay your bills, perhaps? Oh yes, there are many Simons who masquerade as God's ministers. Simons in the church aren't just those who do the fake miracles. They're also those who try to make money, try to make God a financial commodity. Like God is a, is a cosmic vending machine. Put X amount of dollars into the Lord and he'll give you X amount back as a return, like, a, like, a, like an investment opportunity or something. But unlike many of the char charlatans in our day, Simon was rebuked harshly before his greed was able to grow up into an, uh, a tree of, you know, oppression and, and, and death and, and deception. This is what we're missing today, I think, in the broader church world, is a str like strong rebukes for false prophets. 
We let so many false prophets off the hook so easily. There are so many prophets who came on TV and said, <clears throat> or the internet for the most part, and they said like Donald Trump would win the election. And then there's others who said that Joe Biden would win the election. Well, I mean, Joe Biden is technically the president now, so somebody was wrong. But all those false prophets, they sort of have, <clears throat> they've been off the hook. Well, he, Donald Trump actually won, but it was stolen from him. Okay, but he, you, you were still wrong. And there's no strong rebuke for them. Instead of rebuking the Simons, we make excuses for them. Right? We say silly things like, don't be divisive. Don't divide the church. Well, like, guys, if there's a false prophet, you, you should divide that from the church. You should want to divide that. No, don't be divisive. Or, or you know, touch not God's anointed. Yeah, it, but he's not anointed because he's a false prophet. If he was anointed, sure, yeah, don't touch God's anointed, absolutely. But he's proven he's not. Because God's anointed don't make false prophecies. They don't steal money from people. There is a penalty for false prophets. And I think Peter was actually quite generous to Simon. The Bible says stone him with stones. <laughs> Old Testament prophets. If you prophesy falsely, stone him with stones. Don't allow a false prophet to live. And last I checked, God's anointed prophets don't have a losing record. <laughs> They're not like, you know, one in ten. You either have a perfect record or you're a false prophet. That's God's standard. They don't, they don't practice spiritual shenanigans. Peter would have none of Simon's nonsense, and so Peter, being utterly appalled and disgusted with the proposition that Simon puts before him, like, I'll give you money for this, he kind of, you know, just stares daggers into his souls, and look at what he says. He says, may your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Peter, Peter kind of just said, I mean, in a sense, he says, Simon... Go to hell with that. <laughs> like literally. May your silver perish with you if you think you can obtain God's gift with money. This is how we should speak to and of charlatans in our day. May their silver and their gold perish with them. Because if they continue in this, in this evil, in this wickedness, that's exactly what will happen. Their silver and their gold will perish with them. The gift of God cannot be purchased with money. I don't care how you dress it up, seed offerings, sowing, whatever you want to say. Even the hint that someone is trying to sell the gift of God needs a stern and sharp rebuke. Like the Holy Spirit is not beholden to our financial transactions. It's not like God is waiting saying, well, once you transact X amount of monetary value, then I'll bless you. Right? That's not how it works. He's not constrained. He's not shackled by our financial transactions. <laughs> if a preacher preaches a sermon and many get saved, whether they give money or not has no bearing on what God just did and will do. Look, I'm not suggesting not to give. Of course, give. Give generously. The Lord says he loves a cheerful giver. But he loves a cheerful giver, not a giver who's giving as some sort of long-term financial investment. <laughs> There's a lot of good long-term financial investments for you to, to, to put your money in. Go ahead and do that. But God is not one of them. <laughs> God says, give cheerfully out of a cheerful heart. Why? Because you're grateful for what Christ has done. And so you give cheerfully. And will God bless you? Sure. Will it be financially? Maybe. Maybe it'll be another way. I don't know. I'm not God. But your giving has to be done out of a grateful heart, not a heart of greed. See, a heart of greed says, I'll give only if you give what I want back. You know? Why do you think the, the false uh, uh, prophets always say, you know, give, uh, you know, a thousand and you'll get tenfold. 
You know, they're, they're giving you a number in your head. So you go, okay, well, that's a good investment. So let me give a thousand and then I'll get 10,000 back. That's, that's, that's from a heart, a, a heart of greed. And so Simon heard clearly what Philip was preaching and how Jesus the Messiah suffered for sinners on the cross. And now he rose back to life to give eternal life. And this was the gospel that Simon received, the gift of God, salvation. He had heard it was not purchased with money, it was purchased with the blood of Jesus. But his heart was not right with God because he thought God could be bought with, with silver. So Peter lovingly but harshly corrects his error. Simon's only hope was that he repent and pray that this wickedness that was in his heart would be forgiven him and removed from him. And so Peter, he saw clearly through Simon uh, that his years of practicing magic and, and deceiving people and dabbling in, in demonic things had cast him into sin, and he was deceived. Now imagine being Simon, right, for a minute here. You just hear the gospel. You're just kind of new to the faith. You got baptized, and you go, I, I want to be a part of this. And you think, well, in my previous life, we paid people for stuff like this, and so let me give my best. So maybe he thought he was giving his best, even though it was silver, not gold. So he goes and he approaches them with a the sum of money, and he's thinking, this will get me in their good books, and I'll be a part of this cool thing. And next thing you know, Peter is casting his money aside and telling him to, to like, go to hell. <laughs> like, what? wait a minute, this isn't how it's worked out in the past. This didn't go as planned. It seems as though Simon recognizes, though. Peter rebukes him, says, No, may your silver perish with you. Pray that this be forgiven, your wickedness. So Simon could have said, Forget you guys. You guys are crazy. But instead, he says this in verse 24. Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you said may come upon me. That's a great outcome. That's a good outcome. This is why I said the Simons of the world need to be rebuked. This is why I think Simon was just an immature believer, because when he was corrected, he didn't fight back. He didn't push back. He said, oh, oh, oh okay, well, well, pray for me. I don't want this to happen. I want to be right with God. And the whole point of this was to be right with God. And so he says, pray for me that, th that none of this will happen. So Simon, instead of pushing back against the rebuke, receives the rebuke and, and with a humble heart and says, okay, well, Pray for me. Pray for me that none of this will happen. That's a good outcome. He repents. And the Holy Spirit cannot be bought with money. Now, I know that's like, maybe you might be thinking, well, obviously, you can't buy God with money. Like, we all know that. But there's, there might still be a, a hint in our, in our minds or in our hearts, a more subtle deception. Because we need to remove even a speck of this idea from our hearts and our minds and understand that God is not beholden to our money, that God owns the cattle on the hills. The earth is the, earth is the, the, the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If he wanted all the money in the world, he could have it. He already does. So he's not waiting for you to, to do the right transaction <laughs> in order for him to save somebody. So they continued the apostles on their way, preaching the gospel as they went. So in summary, we see persecution arise in Jerusalem. Church is uh, a scattered. Philip finds himself in a hostile territory in Samaria. Preaches the gospel. People get saved, including a prominent magician named Simon. And, uh, and many, uh, who many thought, then this guy's like Zeus. This guy's like the power of God. And so the apostles come from Jerusalem. They lay hands. People receive the Holy Spirit. Simon sees that, says, hey, I'll give you some silver for that. Peter says, may that perish with you. Remove this wickedness. Pray that you would be forgiven. Harshly rebukes him to repent. And Simon does. It's a, it's a, it's a good story. It's a good, uh, it's, it's a good ending to the story. He repents. He asks for prayer. And the apostles go on their way preaching to other villages. This, now, the, the, the error of Simon is not so uncommon among believers even today. Many people think we can buy the favor of God by giving money to churches or ministries. Just turn on, what's that Christian Canadian channel? CBN? You guys would know. What's it called? Anyway, yeah, anyways, 
you'll hear them say give X amount of money and and God will bless you financially and you'll never be without and stuff and and this is not the teaching of the apostles because you can't you can't buy God's provision a hundred percent of your income is his already he could take it just like that I mean I've heard stories of people giving and receiving I mean it's happened to our in our church you know I, I told the story before about we had a guest preacher come and I was like Lord how much should I pay him and I was going to give him like 50 bucks and the Lord said give him a give him 500 bucks and this was early in the ministry where 500 bucks was like ugh, that's I don't know man, that's that's a lot you know Lord uh, he's coming to preach for like 30 minutes you know, give him 500 bucks I said, all right, all right, all right, I'll do it. So I wrote him the check, $500, boom, 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 paid him, forgot about it. A week later, some, somebody randomly hands me uh, an envelope with $5,000 in it. So I was like, oh, okay, you know, cool. Thank you, Lord, for, for providing. Now, was it because I gave $500 that we got $5,000? I don't know. Seems a little suspicious, right? That it was like tenfold, like the preachers on TV say. <laughs> But I didn't give him 500 bucks because I wanted 5,000. I didn't even want to give him 500 bucks. That, that hurts to write that check. I'm like, oh, Lord, no, I don't want to do this. Oh, but I'll just obey you anyways. Not expecting anything in return. And, and so so I'm, not, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. Sure, it happens. It happens all the time. But to preach that that's God's um, regular working among people, to, to, to stand here and say, give this much and you will definitely get this much? I can't guarantee that. I can't guarantee that. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. I don't know, maybe you'll get more, maybe you'll get nothing. But the idea of giving is not to get. The idea of giving is to give because God so loved the world that he gave. The Bible commands us to give generously as we've purposed in our hearts, not out of compulsion. That's the key. There was a long time where I believed giving to the church was, in a sense, buying the gift of God. I would have never said it that way. But if I'm honest, that's kind of where my actions, my heart was. Remember when I first started tithing, I would, I would tithe like down to the cent, and I made that, like, that promise. I said, God, if you get me out of credit card debt, I'll tithe. <laughs> so I started tithing, and I got out of credit card debt. Now, was it because I started tithing, or was it because I kind of bound myself to a promise. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but I've been giving ever since. Um, but I needed to repent of that superstition that if I give 10%, God will get rid of all my debt. No, I should give 10% and I should pay off my debt. <laughs> it's just good. It's just good. Uh, good principle. The Bible says, you know, if you're in debt, you're a slave to the lender. So do your best to get out of debt, give, and live your life in honor of the Lord. You, know, you don't have to stress about it. It doesn't have to be this big thing like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? No, just give as the Lord has purposed in your heart for you to give. Live by the principles of the Word of God for finances and, and, and go, on, go, go on with it. At the end of the day, the principle here is, is the same as with anything. Surrender it all to the Lord. Say, Lord, this is all yours. I'm all yours. And pray as to how you would use what he has given you for his glory. That's it. How can I support the work of the church? How can I support the work of the gospel? Lord, show me. What's my part? And assist in spreading that word to the end of the earth. Because that's what we see happening in this passage, and that's what the whole Bible is really about. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your provision. Lord, I pray that you would root out of our hearts any greed that might be there, any um, false beliefs that might be there surrounding your gifts and the money we have. Um, help us, Lord, to be good stewards of our, of our gifts good stewards of our money, good stewards of that which you've given us to be used for your glory. Um, and help us, Lord, to, to, to be wise and discerning and, uh, and to live in such a way um, that our resources are multiplied 
for your honor and for your glory so that for generations to come, the name of Jesus might be glorified and esteemed because of the, the decisions we made in our life. Multiply that influence through our uh, words, through our money, and, and through our life. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.